Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jermaine. I have the pleasure of being one of the reporters for IEC Career Month. Hi, my name is Trinity and welcome to Career Month. We have interviewed many great guests and we look forward to what you're about to see. I hope you're excited to see what we have lined up and who I have to interview for you today. So do us a favor, sit back, relax, get a pen, because what you're about to see is going to absolutely blow your mind. Cam was born on December 25th, 1954 in Sudbury, Ontario. He is the oldest of seven who grew up in a small town 20 miles north of Sudbury. He took up shops in high school and liked them all. Woodworking, machine shop, welding, mechanics, and electrical. He worked for the railroad CNR for a while and quit and traveled out west. He later came back and got a job in Sudbury. While working, he applied for an apprenticeship in electrical and wrote an aptitude test and was successful and had to wait for a little while. In 1975, he started his apprenticeship at Fruit Mine and then relocated to North Mine later. Cam is now considering retiring this year and passing the reins to his son Matthew, who has worked for him for 20 years and is also a licensed electrician. I hope you're as excited as I am for this interview. Hi everyone, so today I'm sitting here with Cam and I just have a couple of questions to ask you for career day for our youth. Sure. So the first question is, what is your career? I am a qualified electrician and I have my own business, I'm an electrical contractor. And what's the name of your business? It's Camco Electrical Services Limited. And what do you do? We do job? mostly residential, uh, commercial and some industrial. Industrial. And electrical is based on different, like some do only residential and some companies do mostly commercial but we do a bit of everything so would you prefer residential or commercial no I did residential for a while it's fun but after a while I wanted more of a challenge so I went into commercial and industrial but I just a bit of industrial because uh, it's, it's all totally different you're working with machines and all that right. and it's more of a qualified uh, different uh, kind of a uh, electrical but commercial, there's buildings like a church here. Right. Matter of fact, I have done some work here in this church. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so, wow, that's yeah. nice. I, yeah. I never knew that. But oh, yeah. No, quite a bit of work. We were here yeah, actually last church. week working with Pastor Mike and uh, my son, Matthew, who's a qualified electrician also. Right. Yeah. Hmm. And so what made you choose this career? When I was young, uh, from a small town up north, um, there wasn't that many jobs. There was a mine in Sudbury. And there was uh, the railroad, CNR and CPR. So most of the guys worked. I have a lot of uncles and cousins that worked for the railroad. Matter of fact, I worked for them twice. Okay. Never liked it. Um, uh, I did some trade there, so that wasn't too bad. But uh, I always wanted to be a tradesman, I believe. And uh, so what I did is um, I went out west for a while and then I guess found myself and came back and got a job at Inco, uh, which is a big uh, nickel and copper mine in Sudbury. And while I was there, I applied for electrical. So you write a test and I passed the test and then you wait and I finally got in. Right. And that was in 1975 that I started my apprenticeship. Wow, well, yeah. that seems like so long ago. Uh, I wouldn't know, <laughs> I'm yeah. too young. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, what educational educational requirements? At that time, there? you could get in with a grade 10, but uh, if you wanted to get into the union and all that, you need a grade 12. Right. So. Uh, I would recommend a grade 12 and then you apply and then you get into an apprenticeship program then you go to school while you're working there's three terms you do basic intermediate and advanced mm -hmm. and um, and those when I did it I think it's the same it's two months right so you leave your employer and you go and do the two months in school every day um, and then you go back to work and then the following year they reschedule you for intermediate and then advanced in my time, we used to do also an extra course, which was um, uh, electronics. Right. Now they incorporated in the th the, uh, the courses. So. I know uh, now at my school we have like if you take the auto course or the woodwork, the wood shop course. Yeah. Um, in your twelfth 
great year you can do co-op and that is like working at different um with different companies doing different things and um that's just kind of reminded me of like oh wow yes so, kind of cool yeah my son was a co-op student uh the uh, sort of guy that i've had with me um uh, dean uh, he was a co-op student i've had a, a quite a few co-op students yeah 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 so um it's a good program and then you know and then the kids, uh, if they want to pursue that career, they, they continue. Yeah. Dean continued with me right from high school, you know, and uh, and so did my son. So my son's still working for me. So that's good. That opens up. I feel like that opens up a lot of opportunities because yeah. you know you learn from young. Yeah. And just keep going. And it's a good opportunity too. If it's not your field, then uh, you know, then you move on to other things, right? So do you think that your job um, stands out among others, and if so, why? Well, I think they're all different, but uh, right. yeah, it, it does in a way because uh, you're working with electricity, which uh, could be very dangerous, but uh, it's not if you're following the proper procedures, but uh, it's rewarding and it's, you know, when you put the switch on and lights come on, well, people are amazed sometimes. Right. Know? So we get to do that part, you know, so uh, yeah, it's rewarding. And what advice would you give someone trying to go into uh, trades? Well, first of all, you have to have a passion for that because right. uh, uh, without that, uh, it, uh, you're not going to succeed or you're going to find a very uh, long thing. But if you have a passion for that, for any of the traits, mechanic, uh, woodworking, whatever, um, then you, you find a way to, to pursue that career. And, and it's rewarding, I guess. Uh, Great. Yeah. And I also wouldn't advise long nails. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you see your job um, changing in the next five, ten years? Uh, it's changing a lot because of LED which uh, means uh, light emitting diodes. So all the lights, like these lights in this room here, these are T8s. At one time they were T12s, which was the older style fluorescent. Uh, these are more economical. Now, uh, now we're, turn, we're changing these to uh, LED in the schools and all over the place because it's a win-win. Uh, first of all, uh, the wattage goes down and they're brighter and they last longer and um, so, hydro uh the power companies like it too because with the, all the buildings going up then there is uh there's not enough power where right. led has seemed to have eased that problem so, and so um more that's... buildings or more places are leaning towards led lights oh yes uh, all the, the new buildings it's all led lights the street lights are led um we do retrofit uh, last year last summer i did three schools out of uh, five schools I quoted, I've got three of them, and that was to replace all the lights in the gym, uh, stairwells and stuff like that. So it's quite rewarding and uh, it's, it's nice. Yeah. Right. And um, I know with everything going on in the world, with the pandemic and, um, you know, just Russia, Ukraine, all types of stuff, how do you, has that affected your job in any way? The pandemic has, uh, because uh, my biggest contract right now is with the, uh, the French Catholic and public school board. Right. And we do quite a bit of work for them. And uh, so when the pandemic hit, uh, at the beginning, uh, people panicked a bit and people didn't know what was going to happen. So we, uh, we didn't work for a little bit because we weren't allowed in the school. So we did a little bit other work, like we do work for the waste companies too and all that. So that, they didn't seem to uh, stop with the pandemic, but, uh, but the schools definitely. And then they started saying, well, hey, it's a good time to have contractors mm -hmm. in the schools. There's nobody here except the caretakers. Right. They had to go to open the schools. Uh, so we, they did let us in to do some work. And uh, and now, well, of course, we there's protocols. We have to sign the forms and uh, that we don't have any uh, signs. And then we have to wear a mask and, you know, so. Right. So it's affected everyone. Yeah. Yeah, because, I know uh, the whole masks has yeah. affected everybody. As far as Ukraine, uh, we haven't felt anything yet, but you know, who knows what's going to happen down the road. It's sad, but right. yeah, let's yeah. just hope God intervenes and, uh, and does something in that country. All we can know. do is pray yeah, for healing. True. And the last question I have for you is, um, what do you find most challenging about your job? Uh, challenging? I think um, when, you, when you go to look at a job, like now we have to go look at... Uh, um, it's a veterinary and they're putting an x-ray machine. Well, that's something different for us, but right. but basically it's not. We just have to find, the, like the salesman wanted a price right away. And I told him, I said, well, you have to send me the specs. What are the specs? So he thought it was like, he thought it was 40 amps. Right. And I, I just saw the specs on paper the other day and I said, no, it's more like 100 amps and you're gonna need a transformer. So it's, you know, it's a lot bigger than, 
so and then we need a site inspection so you know things like that it's challenging uh, um, you go to a place and they want uh, you know a certain thing well uh, we have to plan it you have to plan the size of the wire uh, the average whatever you're going to do like if it's a motor or whatever so yeah so those are challenging and, and rewarding at the same time the planning part is more challenging than actually doing the yeah job. i think the, the preparation is like you know like um, a lady called the other day i hadn't seen her for a while she moved she wants to put um she said she had 95 amps well there's no such thing as 95 but i didn't want to tell her it's, it's usually 100 the old days 60 but she wants more than that because she wants to put an electric kiln she wants an elevator for a wheelchair uh, she wants a generator backup well that's a lot of planning and but it's not a big deal you know once you mm -hmm. put it all on paper and you start planning it's all part of the job and it's rewarding it's and you've been doing it for years now so i have been yeah you're used and, to it but i i'm uh, i want to retire this year and i'm hoping my son's take He's thinking of taking over, so. Right. So, yeah. So. Um, in your bi biography, I was reading that you were planning on retiring. Do yeah. you think you're still going to do a little bit of it of on course. the side? Of course. Yes. I'm going to carry my business up north. Uh, we bought a cottage um, almost four years ago, three and a half years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, up in Bancroft. And the, the locals, their uh, neighbors, they're already asking me. One guy wanted me to wire his cottage last year, and I, I said, no. I says, uh, I'm not ready for that yet. Right. But uh, yeah, it's they seem they can't seem to find electricians there. Yeah, like they're booked way. There's not that many, I guess, and they're booked a year or two ahead of time. So some people can't wait that long. So I might do a little job, a uh, little, you know, but not to the impact that I was doing here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just on the side. It, it's time for my son to take over. <laughs> yes, and I know that's probably exciting for you and your family. Yeah. Yeah. Your son yeah. taking over. And taking uh, more time off and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, also, this month is uh, International Women's Month. Uh, yesterday was International Women's Day. And um, do you find there's a lot of uh, women in the electrical trade? Uh, there is more now. When I started my apprenticeship, uh, there wasn't. I don't think there was any right. at the time. Um, uh, there might have been the odd one, but I didn't see any uh, back in 1975. But when I moved to Toronto in 1978 and went to trade school, there was one girl in my class, and uh, actually she was quite quite interesting and quite bright. She used to challenge the teacher a lot, yeah. and the teacher didn't really like that, but she knew her stuff. Uh, she read the code book a lot, and uh, she was an estimator for a big company. And being a, an estimator, I guess they needed, she needed her license, so she was pursuing that, but uh, didn't seem to have a problem, and uh, she, you know she looked like she enjoyed it and all that. So there is a lot more trades people. I meet trades all the time. In factories whatever and uh, I see a lot more women in the trades mm -hmm. I've seen plumbers now welders uh, a lot of carpentry uh, I see a, a, a woman that, and a friend of mine uh, well, I know him as a friend and uh, and his partner uh, they uh, they work together mm -hmm. and uh, she's quite good they do cabinet work and all that right. for offices and uh, yeah so yeah there's a lot more women going in the trades you know one time women would do maybe nursing or something like that but now I see more men in nursing and I see more women in the trades. And, uh, it's starting to and, switch yeah. a bit. Yeah. I think it's good that women are getting out there and starting to do a lot of stuff that, you know, are um, labeled as men only jobs. I feel like, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a good, um, good diversity mm -hmm. and um, a good way to show younger females, younger girls that, you know, you can really do anything you want to do. There's no labels. Or anything like that so I'm glad that you now see that there's more women um, in today's age than there was before oh yeah and uh, even doing residential work right. I find that a lot of the women are more interested uh, and even more knowledgeable uh, in their like say uh, we're doing a kitchen right now in Brampton and and the lady's the one that kind of designed the her own kitchen and brought it to Bam Brampton Kitchen because they said they didn't have people that did that, which I'm surprised for a big company. But mm -hmm. she did her own layout and you know, her husband just kind of went along. And I mean, he had some say in certain decisions, but uh, she didn't want to pick the lighting, right. uh, all that, you know. So, yeah, I, I find that a lot. I used to do a, uh, my friend of mine used to do like a little co-op course. He had a studio in a shop in Toronto and uh, he would do different things and uh, so he asked me to teach electrical mm -hmm. when, once a month I think and I went and the first class was all ladies really I think I only saw one man there one time uh, throughout the couple of years I did it but it was mostly ladies and they, they learned how to do drywall a little mm -hmm. bit how to patch a hole 
uh, my when I used to go to the electrical, I was just showing them how to replace a switch, a plug, maybe a telephone outlet, and they're all interested. They don't like, you know, how yeah. to do that. So, because you know, it's so nice to ask your husband or partner or even to get somebody. You know, it it's takes hard. a while, yeah. it's expensive. I said, you don't need to. You know, here's what you do. You shut the breaker, and then I would explain, and they thought, wow, that's not so bad. And you know, and it's not once you learn. How to do it properly you know so yeah and i know today there's so much of social media youtube videos. google everything yeah my, my two brothers are uh, aircraft engineers and yeah. when i call them for uh, mechanical work they help, you know at one time they would help me now it's can't google it yeah you know and it's true yeah um, i've repaired my atv uh, by myself now and all that you know because everything everything's online it's there yeah and you watch the videos and uh, and they, they explain it there's a lot of uh you know it, it, it's a great uh feature to have that yeah so do you think um that the whole um trades electrical mechanic do you think that that's all going to be taken over um one day because of electronics uh, no 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 you'll always need repairmen i believe um it is changing yeah um i mean robotics and all that uh my brother was actually a, a great uh, technician for robotics mm -hmm. used to work for chrysler up, even went to detroit on their new cars but now he works in, in a mine up north, and the mine is fully automated. Right. Um, when I used to work in a mine, you used to go and dig yourself, you know, and, and uh, I never liked it, that's why I wanted to be a tradesman. But um, these mines are all automated. They right. have these, these uh, drills that are worth, say, $500,000, but you program it, and the drill does everything. Wow. And these guys are, you know, so you still need that person to, pro to, to program that drilling machine. It's amazing, but, that breaks down sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you gotta call a repair guy, you gotta call and somebody that's thing. that's good in electronics or somebody. There's guys that can do program, but there's also a mechanic that has to fix those hydraulic lines. Right. There's also an electrician that has to do the power for that hydraulic machine or that drilling machine. But And they're lacking in tradespeople, you know. Um, so matter of fact, they have to import some sometimes from the Philippines or whatever. And, and some of them uh, are not fully trained in the Canadian way. We have different system here. Europe is mostly 220. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we have a three-phase system and a single-phase system, and 120 to 240. So we have three wires in the neutral. Well, they don't know what that neutral is. Uh, they have to learn it, you know. Uh, but uh, basically, it's similar, but it's not. So, you know, it's once you're trained here, it's a good thing that you know you know the proper procedures and all that. So, but yeah, you'll always need tradespeople. Yeah, right. I, I believe. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming in no and letting me interview you. I hope it helps. And, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. James Curtis is the morning show host and music director on Toronto's Joy Radio and co-host of the popular Between the Grooves Music Faith podcast. This Humber College broadcasting graduate many, many years ago performs voiceovers for radio and television from the Curtis Communications Recording Studio, plus various narrations and special assignments for clients throughout the country. He has served as a judge for the 2013, 2015, 2017, and 2019 Juno Awards in the Contemporary Christian Gospel Album category and is a current member of GMA Canada and Caras. James is currently involved in his local church and community, serving in the sound ministry in addition to special concert performances and events. Given his 30 plus years in involvement in church audio, he has taught comprehensive sound seminars as well as directed many many dramas music productions james is currently married with two wonderful children residing in ontario canada let's hear this amazing interview i am going to have with him so i'm here live on location with a gentleman of great stature his name is james curtis and right now i have the pleasure of just having a creative conversation with james curtis live on location wow <laughs> wow james curtis how you doing i'm doing really good all right here. thanks for being here i appreciate it you've been giving good energy so far so i'm just looking forward to just having a creative conversation and i guess we could start off by centering it around work and profession as far as career what would what insight would you just give us to jump into it work career you know what I, i'm done work for the day so i don't want to talk about work <laughs> sorry um, well, uh, I guess I'll start as to what I do. I'm the morning show host at Joy Radio in Toronto, 
Um, I'm also the music director, which um, people listening to the radio in the morning on their way to work might think that's all I do. A bigger portion of my job is actually the music director. Mm -hmm. And I also host a podcast and I do voiceover work. Um, but my, my bread and butter is working at the radio station. That's what I do. Okay. James Curtis stated for educational requirements that while in school, he had an awkward experience because he went to a Christian school with his brother. After high school, he was able to get into the radio broadcasting program for Humber. And he was able to have his first internship and get his experience. And the great thing about this is he was able to find a way to get paid, which is literally unheard of at that time for an internship. So if you have to take me into just what made you get interested in starting some of those jobs, what would you... Uh, a few different things. I mean, growing up as a kid, now I'm a lot older than, than the youth are, but um, you know, these days you've got you know, your Spotify and your streaming services and, and podcasts and whatever else. When I was a kid, all you had was the radio, mm -hmm. you know, driving to church in the morning on a Sunday or uh, driving to school or if you're in college or university, um, you're listening to the radio. And I can remember being in the car with my siblings, my two brothers and sister, and listening to the radio for them was listening to the music, listening to the songs. And as soon as the announcer would come on, they, you know, switch the, sw switch the station. And for me, I'm thinking, no, oh, no, I want to hear what he has to say, you know? <laughs> so, so for me, that was kind of the battle of growing up. A few different things. Um, I, I went to Islington Evangel Center for, for over 20 years. So I was involved in the sound department. So I was involved in the, in the technical side of things already. And that's, there's a lot of stuff happening. When you think of a radio morning show, there's a lot happening in the background that people don't know. Like they, they think I'm just spinning music. Well, there's a lot happening. Mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, I'm the only one at the radio station. And yet we have news at the top of the hour. We have traffic reports happening and they are not, those people are not physically at the radio station. So I'm controlling all of that stuff along with the music and all the commercials, making sure they air and you know, whatever else I'm talking about. And timing is a big thing too. Everything happens at exactly the, the time that it needs to. News is at the top of the hour, not two minutes past or whatever else. So um, that, that was part of it as far as doing sound in the church, that kind of got me interested a little bit as well. And then um, the other part of it was I, I went to a Christian school, a Christian high school for grades 9, 10, and 11, mm -hmm. and they didn't have a grade 12. When I was in grade 11, there was four people in my class, and one of them was my brother, which mm. is, you know, really, really not a good situation to be in. <laughs> um, and my brother was only in the class with me because he's a, he's a brain, he's a smart aleck, and he skipped a grade. Okay. So, so we were in grade 11 together. So me and my brother, two other girls, and they didn't have a grade 12. I guess it wasn't a cost effective for them to have a grade 12 with only four people in the class. So I ended up going back to the public school system. And that was probably the worst year of my life because I'm now surrounded by people that have already got their friend groups and, you know, I, I just don't fit in. Um, I was, you know, I was really good at French because in the Christian school, they excelled in French, but they didn't excel in math as an example. So I'm mm. struggling in math. Uh, true story, midterm in math when I was in grade 12, um, 23%. Oh, wow. That was my mark. But, you know, I worked hard. I strive to, you know, get the extra help and, and work hard. And I'm happy to say I graduated with a 28%. So luckily I didn't need the course to graduate. <laughs> but, but I remember uh, being in grade 12 and, you know, probably at the tail end, uh, probably January, February, I guess, um, you know, meeting with the guidance counselor. And basically the guidance counselor telling me, you know, um, my, my interpretation of what they said was, you're not smart enough to go to university, which was mm -hmm. entirely true. So here's a book of courses that, you know, because there was no online back then. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's a book, go flip through this book and see what you might be interested in. And I saw radio broadcasting. I thought, that's kind of cool. So I enrolled, I got in, uh, that was at Humber College. Uh, it was a, at that time, a three-year program. Um, and it's now a two-year program. Um, after the first year, um, in my second year, I was the program director of the college radio station. So I was basically uh, managing, I don't know, 50 
other students, the volunteers, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's, it's great to manage people that, that are getting paid, but it's a little bit more difficult to manage volunteers as you mm -hmm. would find in any church anyways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't really tell them what to do. And, um, and then from there, I, I graduated. My, my last year was intended to be an internship um, at a radio station. But what I did after my, uh, after my first year, I got a job at a radio station in Wingham, Ontario. Do you know where Wingham is? I have no idea. Sounds like something so, related to a plane. So no, Wingham is, is, if you look on a map, it's right smack in the middle uh, between Owen Sound and uh, London, okay. Ontario. Right smack. James Curtis also spoke to us about what he would describe his role, whether it was a career, a job, or a passion. He mentioned that he gets to do what he loves and that he wears many hats and that he had the opportunity to continue to pursue what he loves. So for him, it's a passion. It's something that burns on the inside for him. Especially when speaking to him, you could clearly see this is not just a job or a career, but this is who he is as a person. Smack in the middle, if you look on a map, right smack in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, Wingham, Ontario, and this is completely true. The postal code in Wingham, and I learned this while I worked there, the postal code in Wingham is no one goes to Wingham, Ontario. <laughs> N-O-G. <laughs> Two W O. No one goes to Wingham, Ontario, and that is That's that is funny. true. If you live in Wingham, you know what I'm talking about. So, anyways, right. I was working in Wingham uh, at the time. They had a TV station, an AM station, and an FM station. I worked on the AM station. I was the fill-in guy, and I worked there for the summer. And at the end of the summer, I walked into the program director's office and I said, "Here, can you sign this piece of paper?" And it was my internship paperwork. So hmm. I hadn't even finished. I haven't even gone into my second year yet, and I've already done my internship. So my third year was like basically twiddling my thumbs, waiting for a bit, everybody else to finish their internship <laughs> before I could graduate. Uh -huh. So that's the long story of how I how I got into it. No, that's definitely interesting. So for me, you're kind of getting me excited because I'm just like, wow, what a career path. So in terms of what you enjoyed the most, just kind of looking back on it, what would you say? like stood out as a defining moment for what you enjoyed the most? Well, I think I got to say the, the, I didn't stay in radio. I got out of it because I couldn't afford it. And, and you know, for, for anybody, you know, considering a, a job in broadcasting, there is not lots of money in it. Um, you can make some money in it, but there's not tons of money to be made. And I got out of it because I couldn't afford to be working in it. And I, I got other jobs that quite frankly, pay me twice as what I make now. Mm -hmm. um, so it, for me, the enjoyment, uh, and this isn't, this isn't my career, this is everybody's career. If you're not having fun, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, then why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. I can remember sitting in grade six, it was a guidance class, and, and I remember distinctly that day when they set up all these tables in a big round circle, you know, all your desks in a big circle or a big square, I guess, and you're having this conversation and it's supposed to be this, just weird things I remember about that day. Uh, and, and I can still remember this day vividly. Um, the guidance teacher didn't want anybody to put their hands up to talk. If you needed to talk or wanted to say something, you just stretch your arm out across the desk because she wanted to make it really like a casual conversation. But what I remember about that day is the guidance teacher saying, so think about in your head what you want to be. What do you want to do when you get out of you know, high school or college or university? What, is, what, do you, what do you want your career path to be? That was the discussion of that day. And everybody's got all these ideas and they're sharing, I want to do this, I want to do this. And then the guidance teacher said, you know, a majority of you will never do what you want to do. Hmm. And there's going to be reasons for that. Some of it might be family situations. Some of it may be lack of education. Some of it may be um, you would need to relocate and for whatever reason you can't relocate. But a big, big, big factor is money. You won't be able to do what you want to do because you want to be making more money. So mo a lot of people will go out there, get jobs that pay really, really good money, but not be happy in their job. Hmm. And I've been there. I've done that. So I was out of radio. I was making really good money but I wasn't happy doing what I was doing. So I got back into radio again. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, it was by accident that I got back in. 
I, I, it was 20 years later when oh. I got back in and I took my old demo tape. A demo tape is a sampling of what your radio show or what you sounded like on the radio. I took my demo tape, it's like two minutes long and it's just a sampling of one of my shows. I, and it was on a cassette tape and I remember copying it over to a digital file on MP3 or whatever else and I sent it off to a uh, radio station, a Christian radio station, because back in my day when I started in radio, there was no Christian radio, but that's another story, um, <laughs> in Canada anyways. And I sent this, this demo off to a radio station and they immediately replied saying, oh, are you looking to move to our city and working at our radio station? And I'm thinking, wow, really never considered that. I was actually hoping that you guys could pay me to voice some of your commercials, right? That was kind of my whole intention there. Mm -hmm. And then one thing led to another. I didn't go to that station, but I'm good friends with the people that are there. And I went to uh, Joy Radio in Toronto and I've been there uh, ever since. James Curtis also stated, when talking about a career or a job, what stands out? He said that he was able to contribute many different parts of himself using his talents. Because he's a man of many talents, he was able to wear different hats and he's able to have an impact using his ability. James Curtis stated that he enjoys most using his passion to do what he loves. This actually was his first interview since the pandemic. So you could clearly see he's passion based as far as what he's about and the things that he represents. James Curtis stated that the most challenging thing that he finds about his role and what it took to get there is that he had a different mindset for challenges. He didn't believe in challenges. He believed in adjustments because it's throughout his working career that he was able to make different adjustments. So he's seen those challenges as opportunities to grow. So for James Curtis, he was able to start off in broadcasting and then he was able to pivot because he was speaking very honestly and candidly about broadcasting not paying a lot of money. So he was able to venture in to different realms of work and then he was able to return back to broadcasting 20 years later. So he was very upfront and honest about the challenges that he faced. And I did, um, I was five years, I think I was their swing announcer, which meant I would fill in for the morning show or the afternoon drive shows uh, as needed while working a full-time job. So those were long 60, 70 hour weeks, um, not making a lot of money doing the radio stuff at that time. And, and then I had a Saturday show as well. And then eventually uh, I got the opportunity to become the morning show host and the music director and all the other stuff that I'm, that I'm now doing. James Curtis also stated that if there was one thing that he could do differently about his journey and his career is that he had no regrets in life, which is interesting. And he also said that school was an interesting experience because even though he was in school, when he transitioned in high school from a Christian school, and then he was able to transition to another school that he had no regrets, but that the difficulties that he faced along the way, that that's what helped shape him. So he, he said he didn't have any regrets, which I found interesting, but there was just adjustments that he would still make throughout his career, which is very interesting hindsight, kind of looking back. When I asked him about how the pandemic has affected his role, he gave me an interesting answer and I was able to kind of see the type of person that James Curtis is based on finding out if the pandemic affected his job. So his answer was that the pandemic didn't change anything as far as what he did. It just allowed him to be better at what he already does. So for example, his time schedule before the pandemic was different to where he didn't have as much time to spend with his daughter and his family. So now, fast forward in the pandemic, what's changed for him is that he has more time to spend with his daughter and his family because he's waking up earlier in the morning. 
So an interesting thing that was so fascinating that he shared a, about work is that in the mornings, he's waking up at 2 a.m. And I was thinking to myself, 2 a.m., who wakes up for work at 2 a.m.? But because of the level of success that he's at and because of who he is and his discipline, that 2 a.m. helps prepare him for his day, which I found really impressive. As far as advice he would have for someone who's trying to break into the field that they love, is that he was talking about having multiple positions and that throughout his multiple positions that he had, his wife had faith in him. So he had someone in his corner that was able to literally push him through to some of the difficult challenges and adjustments that he faced in life. So some of the advice that he had was for people just to be prepared to work hard and that understanding that broadcasting is not going to make you rich, but it's also a fulfilling opportunity because you get to do what you love. So make sure you have the passion knowing that there's going to be difficult days ahead. So, uh, so a defining moment for me, um, I think the defining moment was when I actually got back into it full time because I actually had thought 20 years earlier, that's it, I'm done with this. And you know, you hear about people that change careers several times over their, over their you know, work career. Um, I never thought that would necessarily happen to me, but I guess in a sense it has. So for last words, or for pieces of advice that James Curtis had for anyone listening, he was able to share that even while I got to speak to him, that it wasn't a job for him, but a passion. He also stated that for an interview, an interview is not an interview, but it's a conversation. So I said, wow, if I was able to apply that level of thinking, then I'd go about addressing things a lot differently. So for me, how I'd summarize the opportunity just to speak to James Curtis is the easiest way to summarize our conversation was the James Curtis effect. There's individuals in life where you speak to and you get an opportunity to actually become better by listening and challenging yourself to be better. That's the type of opportunity I got with James Curtis. So I call it the James Curtis effect because he's such a dynamic and passionate and charismatic person that it rubs off on you naturally. So after I finished this interview, I literally was better, smarter, and more prepared for life after speaking to James Curtis. So this wraps up our conversation and my interview with the incomparable and illustrious James Curtis. God bless, and we'll see you soon. Do you enjoy traveling, spending time in nature, and trying new foods? Because I know I do. And so does our next interviewee. Dr. Ashley Young earned her Doctor of Chiropractic degree with honors from New York Chiropractic College after achieving her Bachelor of Science in Honors Biology from Sir Wilfrid Laurier University. Dr. Young is also certified in active release techniques and neurofunctional acupuncture from McMaster. Dr. Young specializes in preventative care, performance enhancement, and rehabilitative care. Her mission is to be a facilitator in helping her patients achieve their personal health goals by creating an optimal state through functional restoration, pain, and dysfunction reduction. Hi everyone, it's Trinity, and today I'm here with Dr. Ashley Young. So I have a few questions for you today, sure. and I'm going to start with what is your profession and what do you do? So by trait, I'm a chiropractor. Uh, chiropractors are healthcare professionals that focus on the diagnosis and um, treatment of neuromusculoskeletal conditions. We place emphasis on manual adjustments as well as spinal uh, manipulative therapies in order to reduce patients' pain and improve their overall functionality. There are a lot of big words in there. <laughs> um, 
Can you um, explain what, uh, I don't even know, mus muscular? Ne yeah, so neuromusculoskeletal conditions. So that involves anything that has to do with the nervous system, the muscular system, and the skeletal system. Right. So I know in school, I took healthcare last year. Yeah. Um, would you say that is a good um, course to take going into the medical field? 100%. Absolutely. Anything that has to do with anatomy, physiology, chemistry, biology would be great steps. And are there any other um, educational steps you would take to become a healthcare professional? For sure. So the schooling that I did um, involved four years of undergraduate at uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. I pursued a Bachelor of Science in Biology with a major in uh, chemistry as well. After that, I did three and a half years at New York Chiropractic College where I pursued my Doctor of Chiropractic degree. So it's a lot of schooling, that's that for sure. That sounds like a lot of schooling. <laughs> so, um, you studied in New York? I did. And you, did you also study in Toronto? Exactly, yeah. And which one would you prefer, Toronto or New York? Uh, I actually enjoyed both, to be honest with you. I enjoyed my time in Waterloo. That's when I did undergrad. Um, four years. And then I enjoyed my time also in New York State because I went to one of the, the better schools right. for the profession that I wanted to pursue. And um, it's very evidence-based, which, I mean, it should be if you're pursuing any sort of science field. So that's why I decided to head over to New York. And how, uh, what was um, the university experience like? You know, because I know um, when you go into the medical field, there's a lot of work to mm -hmm. do, but then you also want to enjoy, you know, your personal life. Did yeah. you find it hard to balance both? So I'd say maybe in my first two years, I did find it very difficult just because of the workload that was thrown our way was a lot, right. a lot more different compared to what we're used to in high school. Um, so it was a little bit difficult and challenging, um, but once you kind of got the groove of things, it's a little bit easier to kind of balance that work and that work and leisure lifestyle. You definitely do have periods that are very intense, like during midterm week or right. finals weeks. But then again, you do have periods that where you can like chill and rest and hang out with friends and actually get to enjoy the whole experience of being in university. And in your bio, I also read that you enjoy traveling, spending time in nature, and yes. trying new foods. Yes. I love trying new yes. foods. Like that has to be top of my list. Uh -huh. What's your favorite food or new food that you've tried recently? <sighs> Favorite new food that I've tried recently? Um, maybe a couple weeks back, I went to an Indian restaurant in Brampton, um, and we tried um, a chicken tikka dish, which was really good. <laughs> it's like a curry dish mixed with like rotis, mm -hmm. uh, potatoes. It was very good. Brampton represent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think mine has to be maybe. Uh, I went uh, downtown okay. a few weeks few months maybe even now mm -hmm. um, and it was like these hot dogs deep fried hot dogs with cheese also mm -hmm. and you can like get potatoes on it mm -hmm. and dress it how you like and I didn't know if I'd like it at first but it was really good I think it's um, Korean Korean I really liked it interesting I should think I've seen those you know I think on Instagram yeah, yeah like social media yeah. you know they're everywhere that's how I found out about cool, them cool cool I really like them um, what advice would you give someone going into the, um, a chiropractor job so for an individual that's looking to kind of go into the field of chiropractic or any healthcare field, um, I would advise them to go out and uh, shadow. Shadow as many people as possible. That's the best way that you're going to see if this is an environment that you can see yourself in in the future. Because I mean, ultimately, it's a huge time and financial commitment that you're investing into yourself. So that would be my biggest advice. Just go ahead, explore all your options, right. reach out to these individuals, email them, or even drop by their office and be like, hey, I'm interested in pursuing this career. Is it okay if I come in maybe a couple hours a week just to see what, you, what it is that you do? And if I can see myself kind of being in the same sort of profession. Right. Mm -hmm. That's... That sounds, that's, everything you're saying, it sounds like so much like, to take in, <laughs> but in the, at the end and the long run, it's worth it because, you know, it's something you like to do. Would you say this is a passion of yours that you have? I would definitely say chiropractic is a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I always say chiropractic found me. I didn't find it. And uh, it's funny because when I think of chiropractic, the first thing that like comes into my mind is uh, the purpose diagram, right. purpose Venn diagram, sorry. It consists of four different categories, so it's those things that we're strong at, things that we're good at, uh, things that we love, things that we're able to be paid for, compensated for, and the things that the world needs. And when I find that all four of these things overlap, in the center is when you find your purpose, and that's 
what I think. I think I found my purpose through chiropractic. So, so you sure. would say it's something that um, you've thought about young when you were younger, mm -hmm. or is it something that you have? So it's something that I was exposed to, I'd say maybe about halfway through my undergrad career. Right. Um, I was in a similar sort of position. I knew I wanted to pursue further schooling. So I was like, you know, okay, let me go reach out to some people in the area and see if I can shadow them. And that's when I came across another chiropractor. And I kind of just saw the way that he interacted with his patients and how he was able to help them in a conservative manner. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. I can kind of see myself pursuing that. And then from there on, I pretty much just took every step in order to kind of get to where I am today. So with your chiropractic job, mm -hmm. um, do you travel outside of the country a lot? Or not really? No, not really. Not, really? not for work, but for leisure. I like to travel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, speaking on that, what's mm -hmm. your favorite um, place you've been to? For travel. Uh, for travel. I'd say Costa Rica. That could be just like recency bias. Because <laughs> that was the last place I went to before the pandemic hit. Right. But Costa Rica. I like going to the Caribbean too. Yes. Yeah. I stand 100% beside you with that. Yeah. I love. And you are hot, mm -hmm. to be honest. Yes. I love with a nice beach, exactly. clear water. Exactly. I'm all for it. <laughs> um, so, how has the pandemic affected your job? Um, negative or positive? Mm -hmm. So, that's a really good question. So I s first entered the profession when the pandemic kind of started, I'd okay. say. So I started working December of 2020, and then the pandemic started in the year 2020. So I didn't really know anything different, to be honest with you. Um, but for others that I've spoken to in the professions, they definitely said, like, obviously, the number of individuals that were coming into the clinic mm -hmm. slowed down right. for one of two reasons. People were nervous. They didn't want to catch COVID and also due to uh, some of the mandates that were put in place by politicians right. that kind of caused things to slow down. But with that being said, they found other ways to kind of serve the community. Like telehealth was a huge thing. Um, a lot of times people would book um, virtual appointments online just to make sure that they still have that outreach to the patients and those mm -hmm. patients are receiving the care that they need. And um, in the field that you're in, <laughs> would you say there's uh, more of a male or female um, kind of workers like yeah so initially chiropractic if you maybe looked at it maybe 10 20 years ago as it was predominantly dominated by the male gender right. but today it's it's very very diverse um i'd say in my class like my graduating class alone i'd say maybe 60 percent of us were females mm -hmm. which was quite interesting to see especially now that you have different um specializations mm -hmm. I find that a lot more females are pursuing chiropractic, especially if you want to work with peds, right? A lot of, I, I personally have a lot of friends that work with younger kids. I have friends that work with geriatric populations. So there's like different divisions or denominations you can go into when it comes to chiropractic. So I'd say there's probably an equal balance or a growing um, field of females that are interested in the profession. I know I have thought about going into the medical, medical field multiple, multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, don't think I'm gonna go through with it. I really like I like I'm inspired by a lot of um, nurses, mm -hmm. doctors, chiropractors. You know mm -hmm. everything that has to do with um, being in that field. Yeah. And it's it's so um, kind of like surprising to me. Like you know you get I see like all these workloads that people get. But the paperwork is a lot, <laughs> and I'm I'm looking at it through a phone screen, and yeah. <laughs> you know I'm like I'm overwhelmed looking at it. Yeah. Um, so do you find that um, it's the same thing with you or have you gotten used to it the more you've been working? Definitely. So I'd say it was overwhelming when I was in school right. just because, I mean, it's a whole new experience for me, right? The, the workload was a lot, um, especially stepping into a profession where it's like everyone looks to you for help, right? right. It's, it can be overwhelming at times, but it's very rewarding. I must say it's very rewarding. Yeah. I feel like, um, well, my aunt, she actually is a nurse mm -hmm. and, you know, I see her, she's like, she's living her life, mm -hmm. you know, and she's like, oh yeah, it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, since school. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> maybe we're all different. I don't know. Um, but how do you see your job changing in the next five to 10 years? How do I see my job changing? I definitely see chiropractic growing as a profession. Mm -hmm. Um, as for myself, I hope to have my own practice in about five to ten years, you know, right. God willing. Right. Um, I want to be able to help my community have a greater outreach and um, ultimately just give back and help people in terms of uh, improving their overall care.
right. healthcare. Yeah. And um, last question, or I shouldn't say question, but do you have any advice for our youth who will be watching, mm -hmm. who um, maybe want to get into the chiropractic field or even just the medical field in general? Yeah. So my biggest advice to anybody that's interested in uh, pursuing whatever sector that it is you're interested in going forward with is to go out there and shadow. Gain that experience. Um, first, I'd say the most important thing for you to do is have some self-reflection. Uh, stop, you know, give yourself a second and think about what it is that you want to pursue. Um, I know a lot of times, we, you know, we graduate middle school or we graduate high school and a lot of times we don't know what we kind of want to do. What's that next step? We're so used to being like, you know, guided throughout life, especially right. in the educational system here. Um, so it's very important for you to go, go ahead and take that step back and like realize what your passions are. And then go out there and shadow people, like, you know, don't be afraid, Place, put yourself in uncomfortable situations because right. that's ultimately how we grow and that's how you find your purpose in life. So that would be my biggest advice. Right, and I think, um, so I'm in grade 12, so um, I recently got accepted into Humber College for Law. Congratulations. Thank you. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking about, oh, how am I going to do this? Like, it's so much work. You know, I see, like, videos of other people explaining their experiences on it, and it's like, this, I can't do this, but, you know, I'm really going to try and push through and do what I have to do, because, like you said, it's rewarding at yeah. the end of it. So, you know, I really want to get to that point in my life where I feel like everything that I've done has paid off Absolutely. in the long run. And it will, and it will. Just take it one step at a time. Right, so yeah. listening to your story is really, like, inspiring me. Like, I'm getting excited to go to school, like, <laughs> you know, because I want to travel. Yeah. Um, I want to do all, like, the luxurious things, because, you know, that's just how I am. Of I course, like, why not? <laughs> I like being happy and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think um, I'm very excited yeah. hearing your story. Thank you for letting me interview you. And it Thank was nice you. It was a pleasure you. meeting you. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>